Okay, hello everybody. This is Brother Luke, Sin City Preacher. Uh, tonight, uh, we are beginning uh, a new topic, uh, examining Christian creeds. So this will be part one. Uh, we'll talk about it for an hour tonight. And then I expect that we'll probably have to have 10 or 20 or 30 sessions before we are finished examining all the various creeds that I've discovered. There really are a lot of them. Um, but uh, before we get started here, uh, let me ask Brother Eric to introduce himself. Hello, it's me again. The homo. Okay. <clears throat> well, I noticed uh, between last night and tonight, you reverted back to your old sign instead of the one you had last night. Okay, uh, since you pressed the issue, I'm going to go ahead and tell you right now. The homo don't mean nothing. This is all that matters right here. Can you read that? It, okay, as long as you can read it, it says, believe the gospel of Jesus Christ and love one another. Okay, that's my new credo. <laughs> <laughs> what does it say below that? Okay, below that it says in fine print, Jesus Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and he was buried, and he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. Okay. Yeah, yeah, that's right. That's that's how they get you with the fine print. <laughs> you never don't don't neglect to study the fine print. It's very important. <laughs> uh, a lot of people though, they would make that uh, the bold print, but it, but it's all it's all beautiful. I like your I like your statement there. <clears throat> um, well. If you've been following these uh, discussions uh, recently, you know that um, we've spent actually now 12 hours discussing early Christian history, uh, history, and uh, we're we're still continuing that. I was I think it was last night we had uh, part 12. Um, so we're alternating between early Christian history, uh, the Book of John the book of Job, and the book of Proverbs. So they're basically, uh, each night is one of these four topics. And now I, I have a fifth topic. And this this uh, topic here became interesting to me because as I've been studying early church history, I, I learned about the origins of the first creeds, uh, particularly the, the Nicene Creed that was established in 325 A.D., and then the revised Nicene Creed that was established uh, at the Council of uh, uh, Constantinople uh, in uh, 381 AD. Um, but uh, I've learned that uh, these creeds, how they came about, the purpose of them. And uh, as I've started looking at these creeds, and I, I just Googled Christian creeds, and I found out there's really a lot of them. And I wasn't aware of how many there were. But as I'm looking at these creeds, I'm seeing the things that they emphasize. And also there are things that I believe they, they've neglected. <clears throat> but uh, if you know my channel very well, Sin City Preacher, you know that uh, I, I don't publish uh, the Nicene Creed or the Apostles Creed or any of the other creeds. I, I have written my own. You can call it a creed. I call it my statement of faith. But that's really what a creed is, a, a statement of faith that was written by the church or a council uh, or a sect of Christians. Uh, and so I put my statement of faith, stating my core doctrines, what I believe are the core doctrines of Christianity, uh, I put that on every single video in the, in the description section of the video. Um, so I, I don't want anybody to be confused about, uh, you know, what I believe. And now the creeds, though, um, were written so that the, 
the the people who wrote the the creed usually it was um, uh, a group of people who held certain common beliefs. Um, some of them were written by ecumenical councils where they had church leaders from around the world come together uh, and have a have a council, have a meeting to to kind of discuss some basic doctrines and that, that there was uh, and try to find some unit some uh, common ground and agreement. So then when they did, they would write a creed based upon what they had agreed to. Um, but the, they also wanted to, uh, what, one of the nice things I learned about uh, how these creeds were, when they were established, they didn't want to, they wanted to make them specific enough to uh, declare what was really, really important and yet not put everything in it because they wanted to allow a lot of room for uh, diff differing opinions on a wide variety of other theological questions because the more things you put in the creed and say this this is essential you've got to agree with this the more things you put in it the more people are eliminated because uh you know if you put enough theological questions in there you're going to find someone saying well i don't agree with that <laughs> i found that out from my experience on youtube over the years is that uh the more i've t dared to talk about varying uh theological subjects and and to discuss it and sometimes take a position that uh when you take a a position then you're going to have maybe half the people say oh i agree with that good job brother luke and then you have a, another half of the people say i don't like that man you, i'm i'm uh, never gonna never gonna participate with brother luke again he's a heretic <laughs> so uh we have uh you want to make your, your creed or your core doctrines, and in my case, the, my statement of faith, I wanted to make it as uh, cover the things that are really, really important, and that, but not so broad that all theological subjects are part of it. Let me see who we have here who just joined us. Random. Um, let me let Random on here for a minute see who he is. Hello, uh, Random? Hello. Hi. Uh, let me ask you: uh, Did you read the uh, statement of faith and the channel, the uh, uh, hangout rules? Uh, no, I didn't see that. Well, I'd like for you to, to read that when you, with the link that you clicked on, it said, "Please do not join the hangout unless you read the rules and you you under agree to them." So, uh, please take a minute to read that and tell me if there's anything, if we have any disagreement on these core doctrines and uh, let me know and uh, then uh, if if we're in agreement then you can participate is that okay why don't, why don't you want anybody else in the room no I don't I don't that's that's the rules okay so you go ahead and let me know if you agree hello so uh, hello brother Stephen hey Come there on, your camera straight you're sideways so oh, hold on am I good yeah okay all right, uh, all right so let me get to um, Brother uh, Eric, and uh, you've heard my my opening remarks here about the creeds. Let me get, give you first chance to to respond to it. Uh, I had a really good answer lined up too, and then uh, I forgot all about what. But uh, how about you, Stephen? Did you hear any uh anything previously before you came in? I literally just got out of my car and jumped in this call, so I do not know what happened like in the last five or so minutes. Uh, all right. Well, let me just go on then. Okay, go ahead and mute your mute your mic uh, when you're, until it's your turn. And uh, random uh, when you after you read the uh, the the rules and the statement of faith, uh, just get back to me. Let me know if we're in agreement or not. Okay, um, I've got a link here. Uh, yes. Okay, I've got a link here that I'm going to post here so you can uh, use this as a source. Uh, go to that and save it. This is a link for uh, uh, a list of, of um, uh, a variety of Christian creeds. And that's what we're going to start. We're starting, this is part one of the study of Christian creeds. We're going to examine them. So let me go to that now. Okay, uh, 
It says, Christianity has, through church history, produced a number of Christian creeds, confessions, and statements of faith. The following lists are provided. Uh, in many cases, individual churches will address further doctrinal questions in a set of bylaws. Uh, smaller churches see this as a formality, while churches of a larger size build this to be a large document describing the practical functioning of the church. And then it's got uh, a, a lot of various creeds that we're going to be looking at. The first one I'm going to look at is, let's see, just the subject of biblical creeds. And there they are. Let me back up here. Uh, I'm going to go to the very f first part that says primary creeds. And we got a list here of Apostles' Creed, the Creed of Nicaea, the Creed of Jerusalem, Nicene Cantalopian Creed, Chalcedonian Creed, Athanasian Creed, and these. This is just the beginning. There's many more we're going to look at. But what we want to do is examine these creeds, uh, see what they say, and then also see what they don't say, because one of the things that I've learned from uh, um, uh, my initial studies of this is that uh, uh, the, the creeds uh, were meant to establish a, a, uh, a set of uh, beliefs. Almost all creeds start with the saying, I believe or we believe in, in the following. And they, they, want, they want to find some common ground on, on certain subject matter of a theology. Uh, however, there's a lot of sub subjects, theological subjects, that are not part of the creed. And p part of the reason for that is that they don't, they don't want to make it so broad that because then you're requiring everybody agree on a hundred things. And then pretty eventually everybody has to say, I can't participate because there's something on your list that I, I can't agree to. So they, they, they're making it pretty, pretty narrow. Um, all right. Okay, so let's go to this. First, let me ask Brother uh, Stephen if he wants to say anything at this point. Yeah, I'm trying to find this link as we speak right now. Like, I just jumped onto a computer. But, you know, when I think of creeds and statements of faith, mostly I just think of, like, the primary creed that, you know, all of us share here. You know, of course, you know, that Christ died for us you know, and was buried and rose three days later, and that, you know, trusting in him is the only way to our salvation. You know, that's our primary creed here. And, of course, there's other, like, small ones, but, of course, we have other stuff going on, but, yeah, pretty much you're going to see creeds, like, all over the place in movements. But until I can get this link up, I'm not going to have much else to say right now. Uh, all right. Uh, now, already... Um... Brother Stephen mentioned the uh, the creed of the uh, this, the fact that the gospel says that um, Christ died. For, Paul Troy writes in 1 Corinthians 15 verses 3 and 4 that Christ died for our sins. He was buried on the third day. He was raised from the dead according to the scriptures. And uh, one of the things that I learned of recently. Uh, a couple of years ago, uh, is that this actually was a creed in the beginning of the church that he was stating. So it wasn't that just Paul said this and it became, okay, this is the gospel, but it was commonly just that's what everybody just accepted as this is the core the core belief of, of uh, the beginnings of the church. Um, so, um, yeah, I think that might have been the very first creed, and there's not that much to it. It's just that Christ died for our sins. He was buried, and on the third day, he rose from the dead. Uh, that's a very concise, short creed, uh, and many times we also just refer, refer to that as the gospel. Okay, so now let's look at the Apostles' Creed first. Uh, let me see. I'm going to click on the link, Apostles' Creed. And it says, uh, the Apostles' Creed, sometimes titled Symbol of the Apostles, is an early statement of Christian belief, a creed or symbol. It is widely used by a number of Christian denominations for both liturgical and catechetical, cate, 
catechal purposes, most visibly by liturgical churches of Western tradition, including the Roman Catholic Church, Lutheranism, and Anglicanism. It is also used by Presbyterians, Methodists, and Congregationalists. Um, all right, so let me first let me ask you to respond to that. Oh, I'm kind of lost here. Go ahead, Stephen. Uh, Stephen's gone, looks like. Okay. Uh, are you going to respond to that, Brother Eric? Uh, what, what do you mean you're lost? Uh, I lost my place. It looks like the uh, website's asking for a donation. <laughs> All right, I'll continue on. I'll continue on. All right, are you listening? No, I just all you gotta do is respond to what I just said. Okay. Um, no, I didn't hear that. Uh, you want to repeat that? All right. This is telling us a little bit about the Apostles' Creed. It says it's a, a early statement uh, of Christian belief, a creed or symbol. It is widely used by a number of Christian denominations including Roman Catholic Church, Lutheranism, Anglicanism, Presbyterians, Methodists, and Congregationalists. Okay, uh, so we get to hear creeds from every uh, different denomination, don't we? Well, sounds good. Uh, I'm interested in uh, the Church of the Nazarene. Are you familiar with those? What's their gospel? Uh, yeah, I am, but I, we're not on that subject now. We're on the Apostles' Creed, so let's stick with that. Okay. All right. I'll re continue discuss, telling you more about the Apostles' Creed, and then we'll read it. The Apostles' Creed was based on Christian theological understanding of the canonical gospels, the letters of the New Testament, and to a lesser extent, the Old Testament. Its basis appears to be the Old Roman Creed, known also as the Old Roman Symbol. Because of the early origin of its original form, it does not address some Christological issues defined in the Nicene and other Christian creeds. Uh, it thus says nothing explicitly about the divinity and either of either Jesus or the Holy Spirit. This makes it acceptable to many Arians and Unitarians. Nor does it address many other theological questions that became objects of dispute centuries later. Uh, that's important to, to note. So what's your response to that? So uh, it's a pretty basic creed then. Uh, probably most of Christianity would agree with it. Huh. Well, the point I'm making is that the smaller the creed is, uh, the 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 more people can can uh, be included. But the the more uh, points in the creed, the the the, the narrower the, the congregation around it. The, because the more things you put in it, you're going to find more and more areas of disagreement. So in this case, the Apostles' Creed, uh, it even the Arians can use it because the Arians, of course, they don't believe in the deity of Christ. You know, they they they, they don't they believe he's a creature. He's created being, not eternal. Um, and the same thing with uh, Unitarians. Uh, so um, the Apostles' Creed has very little uh oh Steve's back, huh? Sorry, technical difficulties trying to find the link. So I'm just going to have to play it by ear. All right. Well, just you're going to have to listen then, okay? Uh, all right. The first mentions of the expression Apostles' Creed occurs in a letter th of 390 from a synod in Milan and may have been associated with the belief widely accepted in the 4th century that under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, each of the 12 apostles contributed an article of, uh, of a creed. Um, let's read the creed here, if I can find it. 
Okay, I'm going to actually read the creed, uh, and then uh, and then we'll I'll read the whole thing, and then we'll discuss it point by point. It says, now as I said, pretty much all the creeds start off with "I believe" or "We believe." It says, "I believe in God, the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord." who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic and Apostolic Church, the communion of the saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. So that's the Apostles' Creed. And I remember that uh, growing up as a Roman Catholic, there was a lot of various prayers that we had to memorize and repeat. The Apostles' Creed, the Lord's Prayer, and the, uh, um, what's the one about Mary? I forgot the, I don't even know the title of it. But, uh, Hail Mary? Mary. Hail Mary, I guess, is the name of it. So Hail Mary, the the Lord's Prayer, and the Apostles' Creed is what I learned as a kid, as growing up as a Roman Catholic. And um, so, but the Apostles' Creed is used is uh, recited by a lot of the different uh, churches that I just mentioned earlier. Now, does anything stand out to you in the initial reading uh, uh, that is either a problem? Uh, or uh, a problem either because it's there or because something was omitted. Well, I mean, yeah, I hear a lot of Catholic stuff, you know, and I hear, you know, they talk about each part. I think the thing that sticks out most to me is the fact that it says Jesus went down to hell. That's what really sticks out the most to me. And because there's a lot of, like, controversy on that. And... And then I know it talks about, like, we believe in, like, the Catholic doctrine and stuff like that, and which just makes me feel like you're just having to, like, put dependence on just one, like, denomination, you know, so, so to speak. Just for this first reading, that's what I'm picking up on it so far. But, so, but everything else, it seemed like it just went into the significance pretty much on, you know, every aspect of the Trinity and all that stuff. Okay. Yeah, I uh, I see uh, everything is there that needs to be there. Um, the death, burial, and resurrection. I believe in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Looks good to me. Okay, back to you. Mm -hmm. All right. Let's go through it point by point. Then it says, "I believe." Um, I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord. Uh, now, what it what stood out to me, and what it also said in the introduction to this, is that uh, uh, the the subject of the de deity of Christ is not addressed in here, as we would see in the Nicene Creed. Uh, it's they're not taking a position explicitly the way it is in the Nicene Creed. So that is. Um, says, I believe in God, the Father Almighty. So he's saying that the Father is God. He's the Creator. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord. Now, because it says, I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, uh, that leaves an awful lot up for debate and discussion because there's no declaration that uh, the fact that Jesus is the Son of God, well, what does that mean? Is he also God? Uh, is, he, is he a created being? Does he have a beginning? Is he eternal? Um, is he a lesser God than the Father? None of these things are um, that people argued about for centuries is expressed in this creed. It's just left wide open. It just says Jesus is the Son of God. So I would I would say that 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 would be something that's important. Now, if you look at uh, the statement of faith that I've uh, published, um, 
it says, um, let me see, Jesus Christ is the eternal God, the only Savior, and the sole source of eternal life. Uh, Jesus is the eternal God manifest in the flesh as the Son of God. So in, in the statement of faith that I've, I've written for myself, uh, and again, everybody, any individual or any church organization uh, can write their own statement of faith. The things that they declare are their core beliefs. Uh, and, and then uh, throughout history, church councils have come up with these creeds, uh, writing what they think is really important. But for me, this is, this is really important, that Jesus Christ is the eternal God, the only Savior, the sole source of eternal life. Uh, and then, of course, um, it says that Jesus Christ is the eternal God manifest in the flesh as the Son of God. So I think expressing that Jesus is eternal, that he's making that a clear declaration instead of leaving it wide open for, for you know, a variety of interpretations, uh, I think that's important. And I don't see that here. In the Apostles' Creed, it says, I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit. Do you see the point? Yes, I see it. And it's very clear and simple to me. Uh, the Creed is broken into three parts, uh, indicating the Trinity and uh, Christ's deity is inferred in his Sonship, which the Bible is clear about uh, the Son inherits all things from the Father. Uh, there's no question to me. There should be no misunderstandings. I love this creed. It's very simple, and I'm going to memorize it. Okay, back to you. Well, I mean, it definitely does talk about his deity as being, you know, God's only Son about his uniqueness. But now that, you know, you mentioned it, I can see how it's a little bit too wide open. So, you know, I can see why it would be, you know, cause, like, arguments or debates like in this type of situation well this just happens to be the first creed we're looking at as we compare we examine and compare all these creeds over probably the next several months uh, you're going to see some things are um, very clear in one creed and in another creed it it is either not stated at all or stated in an ambiguous way and I believe that the Apostles' Creed, what I've read so far, is ambiguous, and it's not declaring that Jesus is eternal God Almighty. And to me, this is essential uh, because there has been an argument in the beginning of church history and even going on today about the identity of Jesus. Uh, is he an angel? Is he uh, uh, the first one that God created? God created him, and then Jesus created the, everything else. Uh, or, or is he eternal? Is he co-eternal with, along with the Father? All these things are uh, have been debated and still being argued all throughout the world today. And uh, I believe the the eternal. See, you can, you can only uh, be God if you're eternal. If you're not eternal, you're not God. This is this is one of the primary um, attributes of God is that he's eternal. He does not have a beginning. And if they don't declare that and define it that way, and then I think the creed is lacking. Uh, I'll move on to the next point, but first, do you want to say anything further about that? It's okay. I believe uh, it's very well fine that we declare that because it's true. But now it is declared in the in the sonship in the son, God's only begotten son. Uh, if we start catering to these uh, sissies that won't accept scripture for what it is, and they're still not going to accept it. We've catered to them, and they still won't accept I like what the apostles did. The apostles did this themselves. The twelve apostles. Okay, back to you. Well, that is uh, that is very much in dispute. Uh, that's mm. just a, a, like a legend. Whether the actual apostles got together and wrote this creed is highly doubtful. Okay. Uh, all right, Brother Stephen, anything before we move forward? Yeah, I mean, I guess, you know, if the apostles would have written this creed, I mean, they were all, like, they were around Jesus. And, you know, and Jesus, 
you know, even said that I and the Father, I and the Father are one. So I mean, he did, did declare he was equal with God. So I feel like it would be a lot more specific than this if the you know disciples had you know written it. But other than that, I don't really have anything else to add as of right now. Uh, all right, let me move, move to the next point where it says. Um, um, so it, it says, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. Uh, I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary. All right, so this is a point that uh, personally I, I didn't write that down in, in my statement of faith. I believe this. This is, uh, this, I'm not challenging the truth. I believe Jesus was conceived by the Holy Spirit. It says that in the Bible. He is born of the Virgin Mary. It's not something that I uh, felt that uh, is essential for a person to understand and uh, that I feel that. See, the thing is, the more things you put in a creed, the more, uh, the fewer people who are going can accept the creed. That's why it says here in the, in the intro to this creed, it says that uh, uh, this, because it's it's very narrow. It's I mean it's very it's not really specific. It's used by Roman Catholics, Lutherans, Anglicans, Presbyterians, Methodists, and Congregationalists, and it's even acceptable to Arians and Unitarians. And a Unitarian, uh, it says. Uh, it, it's a Christian theology that constitutes a belief in God and his unitary nature for Unitarian Universalism, which holds no specific creeds concerning Christianity, God, or the unit, unitary uh, nature. Um, so the Unitarian does not believe in Trinitarianism. Now, there's more to it than that, but the idea that the, there's three persons that are God um, is not part of it, but my point is that this is uh, it, it, it's acceptable to a large group of people, even people Arians and Unitarians. I would not; they're, they're not even considered to be Christian. Arians were have been rejected rejected since the uh, I think around the fourth century, fourth fifth century is, is is when they were rejected because they denied that Jesus is eternal God. They, the Arians teach that Jesus is uh, the first created being of God. God, cre that God created Jesus and therefore he's not eternal. Um, so if this creed could be accepted by them, I'm saying it's too, it's too, um, uh, it's not specific enough. Um, now let's Let's read a little further. It says, uh, um, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. Okay, was crucified, died, and was buried. Um, now, these are, these are core principles or doctrines in Christianity. Suffered under Pontius Pilate. Uh, do you see any need for suffered under Pontius Pilate? And why do you think that's there? I don't know, but it sure sounds good in the song that Rich Mullins uh, sang about it. I'm not exactly sure why the Pontius... I mean, obviously, the dying, you know, being buried and being resurrected, that's obviously, you know, core. And, I mean, the Pontius Pilate thing, you know, did happen, but I'm not so sure why it's put in there as of right this second, at least. Yeah, um, I read, I learned something recently about that, but I can't recall why that is, uh, uh, why that's in there. But let me go on. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again. Now, uh, um, he descended into hell. Uh, Brother Stephen, uh, you you object to that, right? I've, yeah, I've just seen a lot of controversy about that topic, about like you know him going to hell because, you know a lot a lot of things that I've seen say that you know his death on the cross was enough you know and that was the sacrifice you know right there, but yet there's other people who do believe he's gone to hell and I've just seen like that's been I've just seen a lot of controversy about that topic.
Um, yeah, I believe he went to hell and set the captives free. Uh, just like uh, Scripture says, uh, he took the keys. He's got the keys to death and hell, and he set the captives free. He had a job to do down there, and he went and he did it. He was victorious. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, you seem to be uh, pretty convinced and passionate about that, so maybe you can give me the verse that supports it. If you can, let me know what it is, okay? Um, all right, try to find that, and I'll go on. Uh, on the third day, he rose ag uh, again, so it's, we have the resurrection. However, is there anything that you think that is uh, missing when it says on the third day he rose again? Mm. On the third day, I mean, he died, he was buried, and he rose again. Mm. I mean, he was seen by Mary Magdalene, I think. Oh, hang on. All right, well... Um, uh, this this is something that uh, I'm not going to make an issue of, but I will tell you that I'll speak for some other people who would. And that I know that some people have specifically challenged me when I've referred to the resurrection and not referring to it as a bodily resurrection. There are a lot of people that think that uh, uh, we must state that it's bodily uh, because there are some people, even in the in the scriptures, Paul is arguing that it's a bodily resurrection, and that um, people, these um, uh, Docetists and Gnostics, they <coughs> they didn't believe that Jesus actually had a body, and that was an argument in the beginning of the church, whether Jesus had a body or he was just completely spiritual, and the bodily part was just an illusion. Uh, so. The idea that he was raised from the dead bodily, I think, is a, an important distinction. I don't think I even have that in, in my own statement of faith, but I, I think it's worth uh, worth including. Okay, I'll move on, but first we want to respond to that. Yeah, I agree. Oh, I hope my mic wasn't on that whole time, but um, but yeah, I agree to that because like there is a lot of mis. Uh, we lost him. I guess he'll try to join us again, Brother Eric. I'm pretty sure you booted him. <laughs> no, I didn't. I didn't boot him. I didn't. I wasn't even touching anything. Okay, but okay. What was I saying? But um, we're talking about is it is it important, necessary, or advisable to refer to the resurrection? as bodily I would say it's very important because he 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 came here in the flesh and you know he was fully man you know and fully God you know and he died and he was raised again you know in the flesh so you know he proved that he had the power to take life back so you know as he had said that he could so I mean I think it's a very important thing to you know think about it as being the bodily resurrection and not just a you know they think he had a body, but he didn't, because it was obvious that he did have one. So I think it's an important topic. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, then. Uh, let's go on. Uh, it says, uh, uh, he ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. Any uh, problems with any of that? Okay. Um, then it says, I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic and Apostolic Church, the communion of the saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. 
Okay, so is there anything that's, that you see as an issue here? Well, if they're talking about like having to take communion to be saved or having to like do any works then, or specifically having to do like that Catholic thing just to be saved, I would have an issue with that because like it would sound like it's a work salvation, you know, instead of just the faith alone in Christ alone, you know, as it is. But mm, I've got to remember all the I I'm starting to forget other pieces of it, but that's just what's ringing. That's basically what I'm thinking about as of right now. Brother Eric? Well, this creed is a pretty much an overview with a lot of inferences. Uh, I wonder if they uh, took the trouble to uh, address all the inferences uh, that are present. Do you know? Well, you'd have to be more specific what you mean by inferences. Well, for example, in the communion of saints, that's talking about our fellowship with one another and how we're supposed to love one another. And if we don't, well, we're absolutely useless to each other if we don't love one another. And we're useless to the world because we really can't effectively give them the good news of Jesus Christ if we can't reconcile with each other. We'll never be able to reconcile them to God. Okay, back to you. Mm. Well, I, a, go ahead. Yeah, I, we must have been hearing different things because when I heard communion, it made me think about the Lord's Supper. So I guess that's why I said what I said at first. Well, you see, that's that's why there's an issue with that in that it's uh, you you see how you read it and you t two different people got two totally different uh, doctrines out of it. And so, therefore, I, I would say that it's it's uh, it's not uh, easily understood. Or uh, you're not you're not going to everybody's not going to immediately understand what that's referring to. Uh, but uh, here's the things problems I see with it. Um, I believe in the Holy Spirit. Okay, well. We believe in the Holy Spirit, well, but, but who is the Spirit? It doesn't say anything about the deity of the Holy Spirit. It doesn't say anything specifically about the deity of Christ. It refers to Jesus as the Son of God, but um, th that is uh, subject to an awful lot of different people's definitions of what the Son of God means. Uh, it could be a lot more specific saying that he is God himself, he is fully God, he's fully man, he's eternal, he's not created. These are the things you're going to see in other creeds, and it's not discussed here at all. It says, it's the same point about the Holy Spirit. I believe in the Holy Spirit. Well, what does it mean to believe in the Holy Spirit? Uh, and then it says, the Holy Catholic and Apostolic Church. Uh, well, here you have um, the idea that... Um, you believe in the Holy Catholic Church, first of all. Uh, the Holy Catholic Church, uh, what, are they, what does Catholic Church mean? Uh, most people today, if you say that you're in the Catholic Church, what are they going to think? They're going to think uh, Petrus Romanus. Verda? Okay. Mm. Well, I guess when I think about, you know, Catholic, you know, someone being in the Catholic Church, I just think about, like, all, like, those man-made traditions and rituals that, like, that they have to follow. And, like, all that, like, all that, like, unnecessary things that they add, like, works, or even, like, that poisonous doctrine that we talked about once, how, like, they'll say that we believe what we do, but then to get to heaven, they'll say that like, they still have to do works. So, I mean, that's what I think about when it comes to, like, you know, Roman Catholicism. Okay, so, you know, here what you did was you immediately associated this with Roman, Roman Catholic. And here's the big problem, is that before we had an official Roman Catholic religion or the Roman Catholic Church where you had, uh, uh, they had declared that, it's uh, based on Rome, it's based on uh, the Pope, and it's um, uh, Roman Catholic. Oh, he's gone again. Um, we had the word term, the word Catholic has been used long before 
uh, Constantine established this, uh, accepted uh, Christianity, legalized it, and then uh, we it became identified as Roman Catholicism. Before that, the word Catholic has been used throughout history. From the beginnings of the, the, the church, they used the word Catholic, but not the way that Brother Stephen thinks of it because he immediately thought this Catholic automatically means Roman Catholic. And then he started listing his grievances against Roman Catholicism, which were all well founded. And, and it's, it's true, his, his criticism of it. But the word Catholic means universal. It just means it's the, it's the same way is that the way that we were use the word church or body of Christ, that means the church is, is, is the total um, collection of all those who are believers in Christ. Every person who's really a Christian is, is, is part, it makes up what the church is or makes up what we call the body of Christ. It's universally all of those people who are believers is the church or is, and, but what they use the word instead of universal, they use the word Catholic, which just literally means universal. It means all of the believers. Uh, and but then the Roman Catholics they they and they identified it as uh, you must be Roman and universal to be in the universal church. Only those who are Roman, not Roman citizens, but believers in the Roman Catholic. He probably missed all that too. Let me see. I don't know what's going on with me tonight. Got like a new that. phone. I guess you missed all that too. I just talked about in to, in responding to you, right? Yeah, I mean, I didn't hear your response, so. Yeah. Okay. Well, I'm, I don't want to repeat it again, but you'll have to go back and watch the video, I guess. But the difference is, uh, this says Catholic, but it doesn't say Roman Catholic, and you immediately associated it as Roman Catholic, and you you correctly identified the flaws, the the heresies in Roman Catholicism. But the word Catholic existed long before uh, the, the concept of Roman Catholicism. And uh, the word Catholic simply means universal. And at one time it was used, Catholic just was used the same way we used the body of Christ or the church. Catholic just meant universally all those who are believers. Uh, but now, today, people hear Catholic and automatically assume that you're part of Roman Catholicism. Okay, so that's why I would object. I don't like using the word Catholic because uh, even though we are Catholics in, 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 this, in the sense that uh, we are part of the body of Christ, it, uh, universally all those who are believers, uh, but when you use the word Catholic, uh, you, unfortunately people immediately think that you are, they identify you as a Roman Catholic. Here's another problem, the communion of the saints. Well, what does that mean? Because in times past and even today, people believe that communion is what keeps you saved. If you're excommunicated, uh, what does excommunicate mean anyway? It's sort of like uh, shunning. Uh, is there a biblical uh, uh, allowance for that doctrine? I don't like it. Okay, back to you. Well, I mean, excommunicated just means kicked out. So pretty much just, you know, spewed out and, you know, thrown out from, you know, like this movement. Hmm. Well, actually, excommunicate means, uh, uh, ex means none, and, uh, not, uh, no, and, and uh, commune, commune, uh, Communicated is based on the word communion. In other words, you're not allowed, if you're excommunicated, you're not allowed to take communion. And even today, the Roman Catholic Church, sometimes if they excommunicate someone, they can still go to church and do other things, but they're supposed to pass up the communion. And they're not allowed to have the Eucharist. They're not allowed to have the Lord's Supper uh, because excommunicate means you can't have communion and and therefore and, and that means that obviously you can't 
They also believe that you, if you can't get the whole, the communion, then you lose the Holy Spirit. You lose the Holy Spirit, and you have to. If you're not continually taking communion, you don't have the Holy Spirit anymore, and you're not saved. So all these things are are connected, and and that's why when you talk about it, it says the communion of the saints. Brother Eric thinks communion of the saints means we all congregate together and go to church together and have fellowship. Brother Eric says communion of the saints, maybe that's referring to the sacrament, the Eucharist, the taking communion. Uh, so it says they believe in these things. They believe in it. But what do they believe about it? It's it's quite vague. I believe in the Holy Spirit. Well, what do you believe? Who who is is it a person? Is it an energy force? Is it a, is it God? Is it uh, 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 the Holy Catholic and, and Apostolic Church, Catholic and Apostolic, you know, Apostolic means that you believe in the church that can be traced back through apostolic succession, through uh, the, the, uh, all the, every city had a bishop, and that bishop would, had to be a, in a succession from the first bishops that were like Peter was the first bishop, they say, of Rome, the church in Rome, uh, and uh, uh, other uh, other cities, they had the first one. The bishop was an apostle, and then uh, the one that replaced them, they they figure, well, this is the one that succeeded the apostle. They learned from the apostle, and therefore uh, they they're tr they can be trusted because they learned from the apostle. After they die, or are replaced, the person that learned from them. So that's what they call apostolic succession. And eventually come to the point that that they can try to trace it back to the first bishop of Rome being Peter, and the, they say that was the first pope. Uh, but that when you, when you say apostolic church, that's what this is referring to. That it's a church that is traced back through apostolic succession. Um, now you've also got. Uh, a, they, it says, I believe in the forgiveness of sins. But does it say that your sins are forgiven when you believe on Jesus as your Savior? When you believe that he died for your sins? And you, you're, uh, you're uh, trusting him for your salvation? It doesn't say anything like that. It just says, I believe in the forgiveness of sins. Well, the, the forgiveness... They, in, in Roman Catholicism, they believe that when you get baptized... Your sins up to that that date are forgiven, but all the sins that come after that are not forgiven. And in order to continually get forgiveness of sins, you've got to go to confession, and then also to get your sins forgiven, and then you've got to take communion to get the Holy Spirit back. You see, so uh, what does it mean to say to them in this Apostles' Creed? What does it mean when they say, "I believe in the forgiveness of sins"? Do you see the problem with this? Yeah, yeah, it's sort of like a, a a programmer trying to explain his programming to the uh, average person, isn't it? I mean, they all knew what they were talking about when they put this together, uh, so much so that they were kind of negligent in uh, uh, making it quite clear to the average guy. Okay. Yeah, just way too like, ambiguous in this situation. Like as you said, like it's not saying how you for, you know, get forgiven for sin, you know, believing on Jesus, or like how it applies, like in this sense. So yeah, just way too big. Yeah. Uh, see, I I find this greatly lacking in many ways. Uh, it it doesn't define that Jesus is eternal, not created. It doesn't um, state that. Uh, um, the forgiveness of sins comes from faith in Jesus, and it, and that uh, it doesn't say anything about uh, eternal security. Um, but you're going to find that in a lot of creeds. Uh, this is, as you said, Brother Stephen, it's ambiguous. And and you know when you first read it, like Brother Eric, you first read it, and you say, "Well, I want to memorize it. That's a really good. I agree with it." You agree with it all, but it's so ambiguous. A lot of people will agree until you start asking them, "Well, what do you mean about?" The forgiveness of sins. You believe in the forgiveness of sins? Well, uh, explain to me. Well, I when I confess to the priest, my sins are forgiven. They'll say. 
or or my sins were forgiven when I got saved, but but now I I, I got to stop sinning, you know, <laughs> you know. So uh, uh, it's just too ambiguous. And then it says the resurrection of the body. Okay, um, that's referring to the future resurrection that we are going to have. And you know, I I I think that that's okay, and, and the life everlasting. But it doesn't say that. Uh, you know, what do we? How do we get this life everlasting? So my problem with it is uh, quite a bit. I, I would never use this as my creed. Uh, and we're, as we go through the Nicene Creed and many others, we're going to find other problems with those too. But at least in the Nicene Creed, we see that they really, that's the whole point of the Nicene Creed, by the way, was to nail down the deity of Christ and explain that he's eternal, not, cre not created. This doesn't address that at all. Okay, so that's the first creed, and we'll go on and continue discussing more and more creeds uh, uh, over the next uh, the future studies on uh, examining the creeds. Um, so let me give your get your overview overview your your thoughts on this study tonight, and then we'll do an invitation for salvation. Wow, I thought it was a great study, Brother Luke. I just wish we could uh, learn more about these creeds in depth, like uh, how it come together like this and uh, what the word creed means. <laughs> okay. Well, it's you know I liked it at first when we first read it, but then it's like as we went further and further on, I started to realize you know, like how vague like it is, like and and how it's. Some parts, you know, are good, but then other parts is just really lacking. But actually, I have a question for Eric right now. You said that you found that, let's say, you had some verses about the hell part. Did you ever find them? What? Okay, <laughs> that's insane. Okay, I've got to get my lawyers. I've got to get my squire to call my lawyers. It's going to be like a week. Okay, back to you. <laughs> Uh, all right, okay. You're, he's not going to let you off the hook on that. Okay, let me finish by saying, just now that we've read the Apostles' Creed and uh, I've voiced my complaints about it, uh, Brother Eric has also concluded that it's, it's quite um, ambiguous and uh, therefore people of, you know, it can say, I, I believe in the forgiveness of sins and, well, guess what? Uh, everybody in the world could, could just about could say, yeah, I believe in the forgiveness of sins too, but but how do we get our sins forgiven? Uh, well, you're going to get a hundred different answers about that. So that's so. Let me read my statement of faith here very quickly, and just just to get a comparison. Not that I'm saying that everybody was going to, should be adopting my creed, but this is after years of thought, study and study and thought. This is what I believe are the most important things for us to always keep in mind as, as Christians, and that is Jesus is the eternal God, the only Savior, and the sole source of eternal life. Jesus is the eternal God manifest in the flesh as the Son of God. When Jesus died on the cross, he paid for the sins of the whole world. When Jesus rose from the dead, he, has, he proved he has power over life and death. Jesus offers salvation and eternal life as a free gift to everyone. We receive the gift of eternal life through faith alone in Christ alone. No works are required to get saved, stay saved, or prove one's salvation. Our salvation is eternally secure. We cannot lose it for any reason. So, uh, you can see that the things that I believe are so important, of the highest importance, Jesus is, is eternal. He's not created. Uh, he he became a man uh, as, as a son of God. He, he, he died for our sins. Our sins are all paid for in full. Uh, he rose from the dead, showing he has power over life and death. We receive salvation as a free gift through faith alone in Christ alone, and then we can never lose it for any reason. These are there because I believe these are the most important uh, doctrines of Christianity. Uh, so I'll be glad to have you compare 
my statement of faith, or we could call it a creed, as we compare as we compare and examine all these ancient creeds. All right, brothers. Uh, uh, last word before we do our uh, final uh, invitation. I like your creed very much. I want to look at it under a microscope. Maybe we could do that together in one of these sessions. Okay. No additional comment as of now. Okay. Uh, we, no matter what subject we discuss in these uh, broadcasts here, uh, we we always want to reserve a little time in the end to tell you, the viewing audience, the uh, the good news. Uh, the good news, uh, that, that's, that's the word gospel translated into English. Gospel is a Greek word. It literally translates to good news. So we've got really good news for you. And, and the good news, basically, the simplest way I can put it is that the, the good news is that uh, salvation and eternal life in heaven is offered to all of us as a free gift from Jesus Christ. <laughs> now that should make you happy. Now I'm going to ask Brother Eric. He really enjoys expounding on that and giving, going into a little more detail. Go ahead, Brother. I'll go ahead and uh, I think you were talking about Stephen. Was, wasn't you meant Stephen? Did, uh, I meant to say Stephen. Okay. All right. Well, that's the best news, that it is a free gift given to us, you know, by Jesus. You know, the good news is that Jesus did what we couldn't do. You know, he was eternal. You know, he was God. You know, the, the God of this entire universe, you know, from the Milky Way to, you know, to every type of galaxy you can think of, to every type of, you know, solar system you can think of and everything. But yet, you know, he sees us here on Earth, and he has so much love and compassion for us. He comes down here in the form of a man, you know, Jesus, fully man, fully God. And he lives the life that we couldn't live. And, you know, not only does he do that, but he fulfills the law. He's pleasing to his Father. You know, he is the Father. Perform he performs, you know, many miracles of many types, including, you know, raising, you know, Lazarus from the dead, turning water to wine, you know, and many others. But he also spoke with divine authority. You know, as he said, you know, in John 6, 47, Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me hath everlasting life. You know, he also said that he had the power you know, to lay down you know, his life and to take it back up. And he proves this because he died, he was buried, and then three days later he rose again, and, you know, proving that everything he said was true. There's not one time that when he said, verily, verily, that it did not come true. You know, and he promised us everlasting life to those who believe on him. He paid for our sins on the cross. You know, he proved who he was when he rose again. And with his blood, he purchased the gift of eternal life. There's nothing else we can do to get it. As it says in John 14, 6, Jesus said, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. No man will come to the Father but by me. You know, the problem is, is many people try to make their own way of salvation. And of course, there many ways you know and mistranslated verses people like to say that you have to work your way to heaven that you have to be obedient that you have to stop sinning that you have to like turn from your sins or you know you fill in the blank you know it's this is all just you know man-made creeds but when Jesus made it very simple it, as it says in Acts 16 30 through 31 you know sirs what's what must I do to be saved and they said believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved Jesus even himself said, you know, in John 6, 29, this is the work of God, that ye believe on him whom he has sent, who was Jesus. There's nothing else you can do. And it's a free gift. Jesus went, you know, he lived the life. He died. He fully paid for it with his own blood. We don't have to do anything. That's the greatest part. And, of course, the best part, as we've mentioned, is you can't lose it no matter what. You know, once he's given you the gift, he won't take it. You know, as he said, you have everlasting life. Not you have temporary life. You have everlasting life. Also as stated in John 10, 28, And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. And, of course, he's talking about, you know, his ones. The ones who have believed in him, 
You have trusted to him. And it's a free gift given to everyone. It doesn't matter how bad you've been, how good you've been, or how whatever you've been. All you have to do, it's not about what you're doing. It's about who are you trusting in. Trust on Jesus alone, and you'll be saved and saved forever. I mean, it's just, it's beyond amazing news because it's not just, you know, other religions like to say that, you know, you have to work your way to God. Well, Jesus came here and did the work for you, and all you have to do is believe. I mean, he's going beyond meeting you in the middle. Like, he did everything for you. So that's all I have, let's say, I have for this. So that's, and it's just an invitation I have for every one of you. All I would ask is just come to Jesus. Come to him and live. Believe on him, and you'll be saved. Well, <laughs> okay, brother, thank, thank you again for telling them the good news. Um, if you go to the description box in this video, I will make sure that I post in there uh, my statement of faith and the Bible verses that support it. Uh, so I, I put that in the description of every one of my videos. So go there and uh, you'll see the verses that uh, the support uh, what Brother uh, Eric uh, brother or Stephen has just told you. Okay, so uh, uh, I, I think this is very interesting. I'm happy about this new topic, uh, and we've got a lot of creeds to discuss. And uh, you're gonna, we're going to find that uh, they. Well, I'll be interested in your reaction to each one of them as we go through them. I haven't looked at them all myself, but I, I have an idea of of uh, the, the basic things in each one of them. Uh, all right. Uh, oh. Oh, brother, brother Eric, uh, if someone believes the message that, that brother Stephen just told them, and now they they believe in Jesus and they're trusting Him for their salvation, and they're they they're guaranteed they're going to go to heaven, because Jesus does guarantee us He'll take us to heaven if we'll trust Him. Uh, then uh, what what's your final remarks on that? Yes, brother Luke, it's not a mystery anymore, and we know what God's word says about his and our salvation that he's given us it's rich and full and free and uh, we really uh, we really should be really really thankful for his salvation that he's given us if we would just take a few moments to think about everything he put into it and uh, everything we get and everything we don't even know we're going to get, which when we do get it, it will make everything we're going through now seem so minuscule. So let's just go ahead and thank uh, the good Lord for giving us his salvation. Dear Lord Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for our sins and being buried and rising again the third day so we could spend eternity with you in paradise. We love you so much for this great gift and we want to share it with everybody. Okay, uh, in Jesus name, Amen. Okay guys, make sure you go and love one another. Okay, back to you. Alright, uh, okay, uh, Brother Eric, Brother Stephen, thanks for joining and me tonight participating. I look forward to next time. Uh, join us uh, nightly, 7 p.m. Pacific time. Bless you in the name of our great Savior God, Jesus Christ.